Thank you, Jesse. appreciate that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for loving us and taking care of us today. Allow us, allow us to focus on you, your direction for our lives and your forgiveness. And Lord, allow us to understand what you have given to us today as a church, to understand the purpose of our body and the purpose of our church and what you desire for us to do and how you can take us and move us to be the church that you want us to be. And understand, allow us to understand your heart and your mission individually, how we corporately work together through individuals that just have a passion for you. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As we had the State of the Church address last week, talked about the future of our church and what God has done within the body of Christ, I believe periodically that the church needs to understand the purpose of its entity. Why are we here? And what are we supposed to do? If the church doesn't understand what we are supposed to be, then we lose focus on our function. We lose focus as far as what is it that I am individually designed to do in the church. Because sometimes church sometimes gets so mis conceived in our minds about why we are here and what we are supposed to do. And sometimes we become lukewarm in our church atmosphere when we lose that focus and that drive within our life. And I believe in Acts chapter 2 is a wonderful picture of the early church on how they stayed focused and how they stayed alive, how they stayed vibrant for the cause of Christ. And every one of them, looking at what God was doing with them, they stayed vitally important to the body of Christ. Uh, I like to use these analogies, and I think they're very important to, to look at. Um, football playoffs are around the corner, and um, my team's out. And then the team that I wanted to cheer after my team, they got out. So I really don't have a dog in the fight. So I have a dog that I'd like to have in the fight, but they're not in there. So I want to uh, use the picture of a football team in four different analogies. And I want you to picture which analogy, knowing football, would be best. Now, taking the football team tied to the church, okay? Because we are all a team. We're all working together. We're all trying to do what God wants us to do. So here's the first team. They're in the, the, the tunnel getting ready to come out, and they've all charged up. They've all prayed. They've all looked at what God is going to do, and they ran out onto the field. They got into the field, and then the team went to the sideline. The coach went on the field. The coach lined up on the 20-yard line. The other 11 players kicked the ball off. The coach caught the ball. And with all of his might, he started running up the field. But 11 guys absolutely knocked him out. He was dead. He was gone. And the other team got on top of him and taunted him. There was nobody to block. There was nobody to play. The coach got killed. He's on the sidelines, going to the hospital, burned out and gone because he tried to do everything himself. He didn't allow the team to play. He tried to do it himself. And when he tried to do it himself, of course, there was no way he would be successful. That's the first team. The second team, they're in the huddle. They come out and they get on the, uh, they get on the field and they all line up for the kickoff. But they get the kickoff, they catch the ball, but they're afraid, so they kneel the ball down. They kneel the ball down, so it's on the 20-yard line. They get into the huddle, and they start talking about the football game. They start talking about the playbook. They start talking about everything that they should be doing. They start talking about all the integral parts of each position. They knew everybody's position and what they should do. They knew every play in the playbook, but they wouldn't get out of the huddle. They stayed in the huddle. The penalty was flown five yards back, five yards back, and now they're on the one-yard line, and they still wouldn't get out of the huddle because they were afraid to get hurt. They were afraid to do their assignment. Of course, they got beat. Well, the third analogy, they were in the tunnel. They come running out. They catch the ball. Then they get on the sideline. They're on there. they lined up. But then they started arguing with each other. I want to play your position. 
I don't like my position. I want to be the quarterback or I want to be the receiver. I don't like the color of my uniform. I don't like the coach. I don't like you. And they argued all the time. They didn't run any plays. They were just aggravated all the time. They just got mad all the time. Their huddle became dysfunction. And sometimes our churches are not focused on what God wants them to be focused on. They focus on their likes and their preferences. And any time a church focuses on their likes and their preferences, they get me syndrome instead of God syndrome. Then you have the fourth analogy. They're in the tunnel. They run out. They know their place. They're equipped to run their place. They are positioned to be the best they could possibly be. And then when the ball is hiked, they actually fulfill their calling, their position, their blocking schemes, their running schemes. The quarterback knows his calls. The coach is in his position calling and equipping the team to do their work. In every one of those analogies in the church, it is so understandable how every one of those analogies take place in the local body, in the church. Sometimes the coach thinks he knows it all, and he's the best guy on the team, so you watch me perform. You watch me work. You do what I tell you to do. You let me do the work, and you just watch the show, and the church will grow. That's the failure, instantaneously. And sometimes the church knows all about the Bible. They know every play in the Bible. They know every story in the Bible. They can tell you what the Bible says, and they can argue with you about what the Bible says, and they can win that debate. But they don't ever do anything for the cause of Christ because they're so focused on what the Bible says, they don't do what the Bible tells them to do. They know it, but they will not do it. The third analogy is very clear because we've all probably been to churches like that where there's animosity and anger and hatred and hurts and scars within their life and they just don't want to play. They want to be part of the team. They want to go into the huddle, but they're afraid or they're hurt or they got some issues, so they don't want to engage because of anger and fears. And then you have the analogy that I believe we must communicate about. How does a church function properly? What is the purpose of the church? Why are we here? What is the calling that God has put upon the body of Christ? And in Acts chapter 2, it gives us a wonderful picture of the early church and how God orchestrated and developed the body of Christ. And when we take Acts chapter 2 and we apply that to our society today and we apply that to our church, we can look at five simple principles that if we can apply these principles within our life, we become a living, vibrant, powerful source that God can bring growth to the body of Christ. And that's the purpose. And the purpose is not so we become larger. The purpose is that the church grows deeper, that we become who God wants us to be. And if we live in our overflow, if we allow God to work within our life, if we take these five principles as the body of Christ, people will see that we have something that they need, and that need is not what I can deliver for them, but what God has done within my life, within my weaknesses, within my scars. That the church has an inner beauty it's not something that we have to dread. It's not something that we should be embarrassed about. It is something that we should pridely step up and say that the body of Christ, Glenville Baptist Church, is something that I give my life to, I give my heart to, I give my resources to. Why? It's because it changed my life. Not the church, but who the church represents. And the church represents Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So if we stay focused on that and listen to these few verses... And let me apply very simply five things that the church must do. Not the church has to do one, two, or three of these things. I'm saying the church must do these five things. And the church is not the coach. The church is not the quarterback. The church is not the receiver. The church is not the center. The church is not the linesman. The church is the team. The concept that we, the body of Christ, must do these five things and we should do them with eager anticipation that we should be motivated challenged that on a daily basis i'm going to stand up and i'm going to be called rightly divided powerful into jesus christ acts chapter 2 
Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Wasn't awesome to see two kids getting baptized. Not grudgingly received the word. They gladly understood that Jesus was their only source for eternity. That Jesus was their only way to have their lives forgiven. That their sins were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. They gladly received that because they realized that that was their only hope. When we get to the point that we understand that Jesus is our only source for our future and the only source of our forgiveness, we can gladly receive that. So the first thing I want you to know is that we have to get to the point that we are a body of baptized believers that understand I gladly receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm not embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed of Jesus. I'm not embarrassed that he forgave me of my sins. I'm not even embarrassed of my sin. Because I know my sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ, and the sin that I did have makes me who I am today. I'm going to stand up and proclaim that Jesus forgave me, and I gladly give my life to him. Until we get to that point, we will become lukewarm and mundane in the body of Christ because we don't gladly understand that Jesus is the power that I have. Baptized, and about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls. They gladly received Christ. And as soon as they received Christ, they were involved in the church. They got into the body of Christ. And when they got into the body of Christ, wonderful things took place. Remember, before they got into the body of Christ, they had to first what? Gladly receive. So the body of Christ are those that have given their life to Christ. They understand that I cannot go to heaven without him. And the body of Christ, the church, is important because once you have been transferred out of Satan's family into God's family, the body is what takes us and keeps us and holds us and gives us the ability to stand against Satan. Because Satan is against you, he's against me, and he hates the individual, and he hates the body of Christ. So, 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. We're going to go back to that word, and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and they had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all who had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. The power of the church. The power of the church is very simple. I want to give you fivefold. The first thing is that Glenville will grow warmer through fellowship. It will grow warmer through fellowship. They believed in the fellowship that the church was read out and doing what God wanted them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. And what, what does that mean? That means we understand that we can't go through this life without help. Just what Jesse's saying. I don't have to be strong. He's strong for me. And I understand that spiritually. I know that I can't do what God can do for me. And sometimes I need help. And what the fellowship is, it's just coming together as a family. Now, a family. We all have... How many of you guys have some dysfunction in your family? Anybody have dysfunction in your family? Everybody's hands raised up. I got both hands up on dysfunction. We all have dysfunction. And a church is no different than the body. A church is no different than your family. We all have dysfunction someplace. But the purpose of the fellowship is that I can attach myself to somebody that I know that's going to help me through this issue. Fellowship. Coming together. Daily they came together and had fellowship. They worked together. They understood that they needed help because the world was against them. And sometimes I believe in our culture today, it is not difficult to become a Christian. And it's not difficult to say I'm a Christian. There's no opposition against us. We can stand up and we can proclaim Christ because there's nobody opposing us. What if we were opposed? What if somebody would say that you can't stand up to be called a Christian? What if you would be hurt, threatened, accused of something just because you say, you know, I believe in Jesus. I believe sometimes we have put our church, our lives on coast mode because there is no opposition. I don't have to stand up for him, but neither do I need to deny him. 
I can just go to church. I could raise my hands in church. I can read the scriptures. I can sing the songs. Nobody's going to say anything. But the core of fellowship is I need people to come alongside me and I can be honest with and transparent with and have authenticity with that I can say, you know what? I struggle. I hurt. I got some issues. And know that there's people that love them as a family that will say, you know what? This is nobody else's issue. Let me minister to you quietly and secretly that I can help you accomplish what God wants for you. So, but so many people are afraid to talk because of this. They're afraid, well, if I tell him, everybody will find out. People will talk. There will be all kinds of rumors. A true family, the true fellowship, is that we are a body of Christ that's a family that can come together. And we, we don't have to have 30,000 friends, and we don't have to have a bunch of people. It is somebody that we can come into, a family, and have community. We can have fellowship. We can love each other and help each other. I believe that we grow warmer through the opportunity of fellowship, and that's getting together, doing activities, doing dinners, doing things that bring us together, not in the church event, but outside of the event to do ministry, to talk, to share, to minister to one another. We grow warmer through fellowship. Glenville will grow deeper through discipleship. Deeper through discipleship. What is discipleship? Discipleship is just a, a learning of the Word of God. Not only learning, but applying. What does this do for me? We have heard hundreds of sermons. We've read hundreds of scriptures. Have those sermons and have those scriptures changed your life? See, I believe the church is full of spiritual babies. Uh-oh, what does that mean? I think you guys know a lot about the scriptures, but we haven't applied the scriptures that we do know. And what discipleship is, is I don't care about memorizing a hundred verses. What I really want to know is, what does God want for me? And if I, if I know 20 verses, if I'm learning this, to, what is God teaching me? How is discipleship transforming my life? How is it becoming real to me? If I just read the scripture because I got my time in, it's 6 o'clock in the morning, I have to read a, ver a chapter, or it's 1030 at night, and I got to put my time in for devotion, and I shut my Bible and close my eyes, but it doesn't learn, it doesn't teach, it doesn't do anything for me, it hasn't transformed me. What I have become, I have become a very old baby. And the body of Christ is full of old babies. Now, what it also can be full of, of new, mature people. Because maturity is not an issue of age. Maturity is a condition of our heart towards God. We don't judge anybody. We don't look to anybody. Your spiritual condition is between you and God. But the body of Christ, my job, our job, is to give you a vehicle in which you can disciple your life to get into the Word of God, to open your eyes spiritually and apply principles to radically change you from being mundane to being spiritually vibrant. That is our goal. That is the purpose of the church. In verse 42, it said, they de devoted themselves in to the teachings of the, of the apostles. It's important that we teach, we apply, we do what God has called us to do. So the fellowship, then we have discipleship. And then in verse 47, Glenville will grow stronger through worship. Now, worship, that's a relative term. Because some people, when you say Glenville needs to worship, the first thing you think about is the keyboard and the choir. Music. We've had people leave our church because they don't like music. We've had people leave the church because they couldn't sing a song. We've had people get upset because certain issues take place in, in the choir. Now, this is a joke, so if you, if you love music, forgive this one. But when Satan, when Satan was kicked out of heaven, you know where he landed? Right in the choir loft. 
because the choir loft, the music of a church has caused more divisiveness than any other topic. Why? It's because worship, music, is emotional. It's passionate. There's people that will stand up and raise their hands and love worship. And there's other people who sit there and say, okay, four songs is a little too much. Okay, it's done. Now I can go to church. There's two sides to every fence. But worship is not music. Worship is the condition of the heart. It's anything that we can do to commune with God. Whether it's on our knees praying or reading the scriptures or singing a song or listening to a sermon. Anytime that we close out anything else and everybody else and we focus on God, we are worshiping God. Whether it's corporately or individually. It's a time where you get alone with God and say, Lord, I need to hear from you. It's not worship. It is not worship. When we come to church and we have music playing, we're sitting here and we're looking around, we're not singing, we're not focusing or we're talking or working on somebody else or talking about something else, it's not worship. Just because you're in a worship service doesn't mean we're worshiping. Worshiping is when we focus totally on what God is doing within our life, where God wants to break us. In a farmer's term, it's this. It's worshiping is like plowing new ground. That plow getting into that ground, and it's turning the dirt over. It's allowing the dirt to become ready to be pliable. It's moving something that's hardened and allowing it to have breath, allowing it to have air, allowing it to be really ready to be the seed to be planted within it. If we are not open to God in worship, not only on Sunday, we're talking every day of the week, daily they communed with God. Every day of the week, having our hearts ready to apply the scripture that God has given to us. And it doesn't have to be the preacher. It could be in the mornings when you open up your scriptures. It could be at night before you go to bed. Anytime that you worship God, God is speaking into your life. And when God speaks into your life and you say, thank you, Lord, for taking care of that. Thank you for opening up my eyes. Thank you for allowing me to have that. You know what that is? That's worship. So we have to get our minds off of worship being music. Worship is about God. We can sing to God. We can pray to God. We can read scriptures back to God. God doesn't look at what we say out of our mouth. Where does God look? The heart. Worship is deep within you. It's not the actions of raising your hands or falling face down before him. Before he sees any action that we perform, before he hears any word that we say, he looks deep within the heart of the individual. And if the church does not focus on God, we have lost the vitality of the body of Christ. We have to have fellowship. We have to have discipleship. But the church must worship. Verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Why were they added to the church? Because they were praising God. The body of Christ is not grown by the preacher or by the people. The body of Christ grows when God finds favor with man and the church. When we do what God has called us to do. When God looks at this church and he sees us being faithful to our calling, faithful to our ministry, faithful to the word, faithful to our worship, faithful to our unity, God says, I have people that need you. I have people that are struggling in this city, in this community, that I need you to minister to them. If we do what God has called us to do, he is going to bring growth to the body of Christ like we cannot comprehend. Praising God and having favor with all the people. They just had that interquality of acceptance. Now, it doesn't mean that they allowed perversion of life within the church because Paul is telling Timothy all the way in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy to stand firm to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let false doctrines get into the church. Don't let things that's going to destroy the church get into the church. But in the early church, what they said is, I know I have to love people. 
I'm going to accept people for who they are, the diversity that they have. I'm going to accept them. But when they are here, I'm going to teach them the very principles of God. I'm going to teach them the very words of God. And they see that the, the word of God has changed me. And I am trying to not be a man pleaser, but I'm going to try to be a God pleaser. And the only way that I can be a God pleaser if I worship him and take his word. And when I worship him and I praise his name, people will see the power of God within my life and the transformation that's taking place within my life. Then they will say, that is where God wants me to be because I need a touch of God. That's the purpose of worship and praising God. And then the fourth thing is Glenville will grow broader through ministry. Glenville will grow broader through ministry. Now let me, let me get into something that's, that is very important. How do we grow broader in ministry? Growing broader in ministry does not mean I'm going to start another ministry. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be a church that has every ministry that everybody needs to have in order to bring people into the church. If I, if I can do the dog and pony show, and I can go to Glenville, I can do this, I can do this, and I can get this done, and this can be happening for my family. If I just start more ministries to get more people, we are going to become ineffective in every ministry. Do you agree with that? The purpose of the church is to broader through ministry. How do we grow broader through ministry? Let me give you an illustration through a picture, okay? Look at this picture now. There you go. Look at that picture. Beautiful flag. It's a picture. In that picture, I want you to understand that every person in the body of Christ, when they gladly received him, they were saved. What happens the moment that you give your life to Christ? You've gladly received him. You've given your life to Christ. He's died on the cross for your sins. You've accepted him. What happens at that moment? The Holy Spirit comes into your life. You have part of the Godhead in your life. It's called the Holy Spirit. At the moment the Holy Spirit comes within your life, he also gives you what is called a spiritual gift. That spiritual gift that God has given to you is a gift from God to be exercised in the body of Christ. When these 3,000 people were added to the church that day, those 3,000 people that were brought into the church also were ministers within the body of Christ. Every person that is in the body of Christ has been given by God a gift. And that gift is to be exercised in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ. When that gift that the Holy Spirit has given to you is exercised in the body of Christ, it is your spiritual gift. Not a talent. Not a talent. It's a gift. It's not something that I'm good at before I was saved. When you got saved, God gave to you a gift that is only from God to be used and edified in the body of Christ. Now, if we gladly receive him, we're added to the body of Christ, we're now we're saved, we've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been forgiven, we have a gift. If we want to grow broader through ministry, it is this. Every person will do its share, will add growth to the body of Christ. What that means is that we, the church, we have to get up and quit enjoying church, but we have to be the church. We have to get up and say, I, that's my calling. That's what I want to do. It's not, is the pastor going to start a new ministry that I can get involved in? I don't know what your spiritual gift is. Everybody's spiritual gift is different. It's all a piece of the puzzle. My spiritual gift is not your spiritual gift. There could be a hundred teachers in this church. hundred teachers. And every teacher would teach different. We have many pastors on the staff. Every one of us pastors speak differently. We have varying gifts and each gift is a picture of the whole. And if our puzzle piece is missing out of the beautiful picture that God has created called the church, if we have puzzle pieces missing, what happens is we become a church that becomes ineffective in the work of Christ. Because other people that are not gifted where you're gifted will have to leave their gift mix to do what God has called you to do. So what we have is we have people serving out of their gift mix. And when you start serving the church, 600 people out 
of your gift mix. I start serving you in my flesh. I try to do right. I, I want to do good for you, but it's not my gift. And if I have to serve people, serve God, where I'm not gifted in, that's when burnout, animosity, anger, and division takes place. But the other side of that is a beautiful picture of what happens in Acts chapter 2 is when everybody, when they gladly received him, said, okay, my turn. They were in favor with man because they served man. They loved people. People saw that they had a passion for them. It wasn't a church that was full of animosity, full of hatred, full of bitterness, full of arrogance. It was a church full of God. It was a church that people were looking at what God has done for them and they tried to transfer that love and that gift and that fellowship and that discipleship into ministry. It doesn't have to be a ministry. It has to be your ministry. What are you gifted in? What is it that God wants you to do? And your gift mix, your spiritual gift, is something that God has given to you. And what's funny about that is, you know, you probably won't even realize what your spiritual gift is. But it'll be obvious to those you minister to. It'll be obvious. They say, man, thanks you for that. Thanks, I needed that. You are perfect in that area. I couldn't do this without you. And when people tell you that God is using you, what they're saying is, I recognize your gift. It's not about your talents. It's not about what you're good at. It's God himself looking at you and say, bam, there you are. That's what I want to give to you. That's what I need you to do in the church. That's where you can be empowered. That's where the body of Christ needs you. You're brought into the church for a purpose. And if we can open our eyes to that one point, we can have worship and we can have discipleship and we can have fellowship, but how we're going to grow broader, what means in more influence, opportunities to win more people to the Christ, is when we, as the body of Christ, says, okay, what's next? What can I do? Where can I serve? It may not be big. It may not be preaching. I like to preach, so mine is preaching. So uh, I, I, whatever yours is, serve God with all your might because the church will grow broader through ministry. But here's the, here's the outcome. This last one is the outcome. It's the outcome of fellowship. It's the outcome of discipleship. It's the outcome of worship. It's the outcome of ministry. It is this. It's evangelism. But Glenville will grow larger through evangelism. In verse 47, it says, And the Lord added to their church daily those who were being saved. Here's my challenge. Out of all five of the pillars of the purpose of the church, this, I believe, has been put on the back burner of most churches because of our society today. We think of Jehovah Witness, or we think of Mormons that knock on people's doors, and we think about them coming in and they want to sit down and they want to talk to you. And automatically, when you see two guys in a black suit riding up on with a bicycle knocking on your door, what do you think? I'm not home. Or some of us say, come on in. Let's have a talk. And so, but one of the, it, it, sometimes it automatically turns a negative opinion about religion. And we have taken that negative opinion about religion because of different cults or different religions We've turned that negative opinion and say, you know what? I don't want people not to like me. I don't want to talk about Christ because I don't want them to think I'm a radical. That I'm a, somebody that's going to bother them and preach at them all the time. Here's my challenge. If we are going to be a church that's going to be effective for the cause of Christ, we need to be evangelists. And how do we become evangelists? Is living through our maturity in our spiritual gift not being afraid to talk to people about what Jesus Christ has done for you. Period. They gladly received Christ. When you gladly receive something, you're saying this, I can't do this without him. I can't go to heaven without him. The blood that he shed was for me. I gladly receive it. 
And if you have a happy heart, a, a joyful heart, and we're all doing the same thing, and you have a passion for Christ because of what he's radically changed your life, it is uncomprehendable for us not to share that love and that forgiveness with people that need him. Uncomprehendable. It's uncomprehendable for us to go to school and go to work and go into our families. If we gladly received Christ, we should so gladly give him out. My question, have we gladly received him? Has Christianity been dumbed down so much because of the fear of religion that Christianity is something that we do. We go to church. It's the right thing to do. We go to church on Sunday morning because we want the appearance of Christianity. We want the appearance of Christ being real within my life. But it's Christianity. Is the relationship between me and God, is it something that I gladly received and has transformed my life? And if I have gladly received him, my job is to be his ambassador. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is somebody that speaks for a higher authority. We are God's ambassador. We are his spokesman. We don't speak in our own authority. We don't speak of what I think. If you're an ambassador of the United States, you represent the President of the United States. You speak for him. If we're an ambassador under Christ, we speak for him, through him. How we become who the church needs to be is we not only serve him in the body, we communicate about him outside of the body. And when we feel a void in people's lives, when we have a passion for Christ and a love for him, and it's obvious that we are radically changed because his love and his forgiveness, we have the opportunity to speak into somebody else's life. And when they daily, they didn't have church every day. So that means they go out into people's lives. And the body of Christ, we're the church in people's lives. They talked to them. They shared with them about the love and the forgiveness of Christ. They sat down them over the lunch table, over the dinner table. And they just started talking about important issues. And it allowed people to ask questions. We do not need to be ashamed. They gladly received him. And if we gladly have received him, let us gladly talk to him. Let us gladly talk to others about him. That's how the church will grow. That's how we need to grow. There's a saying that I, I say a lot, and I believe this to be true in this church more than any other church I've ever served in. It's this saying, if every church is like this church, why do we have to have this church? I think Glenville needs to be uniquely different than any other church. I believe when you walk in these doors and guests walk in these doors and your friends walk in these doors, I want them to say this more than anything else. That was different. Whether they're talking about the music, they're talking about the preaching, or they're talking about the Spirit of God, I want them to say, that was different. I want them to think. I don't necessarily want them to make a radical change within their life on one sermon that I communicate or a song that we sing, because that'll just be emotion. I want them to start thinking about what God can do within their life, and if they give their life to Christ, how it's going to transition into a heart of gladly receiving him. Not out of drudgery, not out of I need, but I gladly give him my life. And then he will become Lord Jesus Christ. Lord. That means preeminent. That means everything I do is for him. That means I worship him. That means I walk, walk for him. That means I talk about him because he is my Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I want Jesus in my life. I need Jesus to forgive me. But do I really want him to be my Lord?
Because if he's my Lord, everything I say, everything I do, everything I, every function within my life, Lord, Jesus Christ. That changes everything. That changes my motivation. That changes my conversation. That changes the words. That changes my jokes. That changes everything that I do when he becomes Lord of my life. Go to our prayer. Dear Father, Lord, I so pray that we are the church that you have uniquely called us to be. Not like any other church, but radically different because you have found favor with us. Just like the early church in Acts chapter 2. How they gladly received you. Lord, give us a passion. Give us a desire, a deep inward desire to be yours. To be your ambassadors. To speak your name. Lord, we need you. The church, the corporate church, and the individual church. We need you like nothing else. Lord, so give us that passion. Give us that desire. Give us that ability to love you. And that you and you alone can radically change us to be who you need us to be. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes in a church service, we, we sing a song, and we have an invitation. It's an opportunity for you to talk to God. I'm going to, I think, what we need to do is each and every one of us, we just need to talk to God. I'm going to ask some music to be played, and I, I'd like to have about a minute of silence and you reflecting with God. Here's what I'd like, I want to ask you just a couple simple questions first question, have I gladly received him? Have I gladly received Christ? Whether I was 7 years old, 15 years old, or 40 years old, it makes no difference what age. But have you accepted him as the Lord and Savior of your life? And that has to be settled down because you can't be spiritually gifted if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And the second thing is when we're talking about the body of Christ, are you serving where Christ wants you to serve? Have you done what Christ wants you to do? Are you actively saying, I am his vessel, uniquely gifted by him to serve? I don't care where it is. God doesn't care. He has given you a gift. And he says, serve. No excuses. Just serve. Find out what I want for you to do. Find a place to do it. And do something for me. I will tell you, the greatest joy you will ever have is when you are serving God in your gift mix. And somebody is radically changed because your willingness to serve Him. You don't know what you're saying is important. You don't know the illustration that you're talking about or your testimony. But somebody is in, in, in your sphere of influence needs to hear what you have to say. And God, through the Holy Spirit, touches their life. And what you say or how you do something has changed them. And they walk up to you and say, thanks. I needed you to do that. I needed you to say that. I need you, you to minister in this area and it changed their heart or their life, or it gave their eyes open for the Spirit of God to work, that is the greatest feeling that you will ever have, knowing that God is using you. There's a significant purpose in your gift. And when you are being used by God, and somebody says, thanks, somebody sees that you're open to using God's gifts, the greatest feeling. But we have to make that decision. 
God is not going to make you receive him. God's not going to make you serve him. It's your choice. I'm just telling you, it's worth every second that you can give to the cause of Christ.